Hi, I'm Hamish Black and welcome to Writing on Games. Bloodborne is one of the best games I've ever played that I don't want to touch again for a very long time. It's genuinely one of the most oppressive gaming experiences I've ever had. It legitimately terrified me, it got under my skin. It's part of why I enjoyed the game so much. As someone who was perhaps getting a little tired of the Dark Souls formula, the idea that this is a horror game first and a Souls game second really appealed to me. What interested me about this was the fact that, on the surface, Bloodborne bears a great deal of resemblance to a traditional Souls game in terms of mechanics and the ebb and flow of combat. And yet, in practice, it's a drastically different experience, both mechanically and structurally. In this episode of Writing on Games, then, I want to explore how the versatility of these mechanics is such that, even by slightly altering them, the context under which you play the game changes entirely. And it's clear to see that the overall vision is different here. It's ironic that I started off last year by talking about how Dark Souls is a celebration of life, because I'm starting off this year by saying that Bloodborne is the complete opposite. This is a game about death, about futility, and about your vision of reality collapsing before you. What's more, through the game's mechanics, it requires you to face these themes more closely than any themes in any other Souls game prior. That is to say, I can't remember the last time I felt as in control of a game as I did with Bloodborne. Even with other Souls games, there's a weight to combat that necessitates a comparatively measured pace in terms of animations. As weird as it sounds, the speed at which Bloodborne moves made it feel like every single movement, every tiny twitch my hands made in my panicked state translated into an on-screen action that could very well turn the tide of an entire battle. This sense of consequence for every action is hammered home by the fact that, especially with bosses, you really don't have much of a choice but to get right in their faces. This isn't like Dark Souls where you can often take a step back due to the slower nature of combat. Even large, imposing bosses in Bloodborne often move faster than the player does, and as such they rarely keep their distance. Not only this, but the much talked about health regeneration system actively encourages you to close the gap. You may take some hits, but if you're not in that monster's face like they are yours, you're losing out on precious opportunities to get that health back. On top of this, the game forces you to consider resource scarcity. At first, I hated the idea that they'd change a healing system that seemed so obviously perfected in the original Dark Souls, but then I realised it's another small way of getting the player to ask totally different questions about their situation than in a traditional Souls game. Do you heal just now and guarantee the health back from that hit you just took, knowing that there's a very real possibility you'll run out of blood vials entirely? Do you risk attempting a parry, knowing that the only way to get more bullets within a battle is to sacrifice some health? It's not a case of backing off and healing, knowing that you'll always have at least 5 Estus flasks when you respawn. You're having to make decisions that risk a significant amount of progress should they not pay off, all whilst perceiving constant enemy movements and attacks in fractions of a second. It makes for a scenario where there really is no respite. You are constantly in the thick of it in every encounter, and it makes for a wholly draining experience. It also runs totally counter to the idea that survival horror games make the odds feel insurmountable by giving you slow, clunky controls. Bloodborne goes the opposite way, giving every minute interaction a great deal of mechanical significance, constantly placing you teetering on the edge of failure in front of huge, powerful beasts. Dark Souls, as every YouTube commentator is quick to point out, is tough but fair. But Bloodborne is the first time where the negative consequences of this rule, the player fucking up, are focused on more than the feeling of accomplishment. This sense of constant draining oppression carries into the more general structure of Bloodborne's world. If you watch my video on Blight Town, you'll know that Dark Souls uses elements like the verticality of its world design to bolster the feeling of accomplishment the player gets after beating a boss, for example. 
you struggle through before usually being allowed to ascend to your reward, sometimes getting to see exactly how far you've come. With some notable exceptions, this is a very deliberate means of letting you know that hey, you're doing alright. This isn't the case with Bloodborne. In many cases, after the physical and mental toll the fight takes on you, you're left with merely a dead end. Hell, for the wet nurse, there's a glitch which means the fight isn't actually recognised as finished for a good few seconds after its health bar has been depleted. There's nowhere to go, you're just waiting to see if you actually have beaten this boss or if the game's just going to pull a fast one on you. Now, of course this isn't actually deliberate, it's a glitch, but for me it felt symbolic of the trial the game had put me through up to that point. It couldn't just let me win. It just so happens that after this fight, you return to the Hunter's Dream, a hub area usually seen to be a safe haven in Souls games, only to find it totally ablaze. It's this kind of aggressively macabre mentality that permeated the entirety of my experience with the game. As I worked my way through these endlessly grim Victorian streets, as opposed to the often breathtaking vistas of other Souls games, I could feel my resolve giving way. After being tested by some of the most difficult bosses I've ever come across and bashing my head against the dead ends they'd provide me, I'd return to the hunter's dream where I'd somnambulate in a kind of purgatory. This didn't feel like the area of quiet safety offered by a place like Firelink, and as the end of the game proves, those worries were well founded. I searched long and hard for Bergenworth, the academy from which everything in the game centres, to find out more about the situation I found myself in. It's one of the joys of other Souls games, finding out more about the obfuscatory narrative presented to you. Perhaps ironically though, when I found this place of higher learning, I found only a boss fight which then plunged the world and my understanding of it further into chaos. Enemy designs were different and often crept into the realm of body horror, as well as forcing me to rethink my strategies for enemies I'd previously taken for granted. Essentially, as my character's insight level increased, so too did I feel more and more like my resolve was being tested at every opportunity, like I was as much a subject of the Lovecraftian horror as my character was. There is no respite, no feeling of accomplishment, just the temporary relief of surviving yet another battle before realising that there's still always more to come. Bloodborne is a game that demands your attention at all times, and never wants you to feel comfortable at any point. Now weirdly, as I played through Bloodborne, a thought that came into my head constantly was that of the new French extremity, that genre that's not quite a genre characterised by stark depictions of extreme violence and taboo. It brought to mind films within it like Martyrs in which you feel like you have sustained a torture witnessing this torture. The artistic merit is clear to see and even if it isn't fun or pleasurable to experience, it's still valuable. In the same way, Bloodborne's surface level gothic horror and gore is almost cartoonish at points, but the game's real horror goes far deeper than this. By shifting just a few mechanics around here and there, we go from a game designed to elevate the player and to celebrate life, to one which revels in beating the player to an absolute pulp. What's great is that it's able to achieve this subtly through mechanics without resorting to the Dark Souls 2 method of just laughing at you and saying this is going to be a hard game. Every facet of Bloodborne's horror is weaved into the very core of its design. Like you feel every punch thrown at the protagonist in Martyrs, in Bloodborne you feel the direct consequence of every decision made, of every hand twitch on the controller, and by the end you feel as exhausted as you did watching that film. Essentially, Bloodborne is one big blight town. Thanks to the way it subtly subverts the typical Dark Souls formula, you may not feel like celebrating when you complete it, but you'll certainly emerge a changed player in the end. So after months and months of YouTube comments begging me to play it, there's my take on Bloodborne. I hope you enjoyed this look at the game and a big thank you to my patron Nick who sent me a PS4 and a copy of the game. I'm really glad I finally got my hands on it. 
I'd also like to take this opportunity to sincerely thank my patrons, without whom this show would not be possible. If you feel like supporting this show, every pledge, no matter how small, means the absolute world to me. If you can't or simply don't want to, however, I'm just happy you're watching the videos. Also, be sure to check out the weekly podcast I do with my friend Nico. It's really fun. We've been doing it about half a year now. There's a link in the description or just search writing on Gamescast on iTunes to hear us laugh at how dumb video games are. And with all of that said, I'm Hamish Black and this has been Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.